channel and on the County Health Department's uh, Facebook page. I will go ahead and turn things over. Well, well first let me introduce uh, the folks that we have on hand. We are minus our two mayors this, more, or this afternoon. They have another commitment. Uh, we have Dr. Bean from IU Health, uh, Dr. Jeremy Adler to my immediate left. I'm Commissioner Tracy Brown and then Dr. Wickard from Franciscan Health seated to my right. So with that, we'll go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Adler. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to our weekly uh, press briefing. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, begin the press briefing with a discussion about face masks. Um, as you can see, all of us here um, brought our face masks along. We were all wearing them uh, uh, on our way over here. And uh, when this meeting is over, and we leave, we'll be putting our masks back on. As we've been stressing to everybody, uh, it is very important that all of us uh, wear masks when we are in public settings. Uh, this is a very important tool to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 in our community. And the importance of wearing masks uh, was highlighted last week uh, when the uh, IU School of Public Health released uh, data from its uh, first phase of its uh, COVID-19 research study uh, that was done here in the state of Indiana. Uh, for this research study, uh, the IU School of Public Health tested uh, 4,600 uh, randomly selected Hoosiers, including people here in Tippecanoe County, uh, who were tested for uh, COVID-19. And there were several key pieces of data uh, that were uh, discovered in this uh, study. Uh, first, the prevalence of COVID-19 in the state of Indiana is 2.8%. Uh, that translates into 186,000 Hoosiers uh, with COVID-19. Uh, here in Tippecanoe County, 2.8% of our population is 5,400 people. Among uh, individuals who tested positive for COVID-19, 44.8% had no symptoms at all. Uh, they were asymptomatic. They had no idea they had COVID-19. That's nearly half of people uh, positive uh, were asymptomatic. Uh, they were able to determine also that the uh, infection mortality rate uh, for COVID-19 is 0.58%. Uh, that is six times higher than the uh, mortality rate for influenza, which is 0.1%. The uh, data on asymptomatic uh, carriers of COVID-19 uh, with nearly half of people testing positive, uh, not displaying any symptoms, really highlights the absolute importance of wearing masks uh, when in public settings. When I wear a mask in, public setting, in a public setting, I am helping to protect those around me, just in case I happen to be one of those individuals who is carrying the virus but displaying no symptoms. In turn, when other people around me wear masks, they are protecting me in case they are an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. So masks work if everybody is wearing a mask. It's a great tool, a very important tool for all of us uh, to use to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, the wearing of masks is of course recommended uh, in Governor Holcomb's uh, Back on Track Indiana plan. And it's been a, a measure that we have been uh, emphasizing here at these press briefings uh, for several weeks. Uh, in addition, uh, since we are in the reopening uh, phase of our community, uh, currently stage two of Governor Holcomb's reopening plan, uh, we need to also uh, continue maintaining a social distance of six feet when in public settings. We need to frequently wash and sanitize our hands and disinfect high touch surfaces. Uh, currently, we need to limit social gatherings as directed by Governor Holcomb uh, to up to 25 people while following social distancing guidelines. Uh, this number will increase to 100 people starting on May 24th uh, when we progress to stage three of Governor Holcomb's Back on Track Indiana plan. In addition, uh, it's important to remember that individuals age 65 and older and those with high risk health conditions should remain at home whenever possible. Businesses that are reopening should modify their operations and their workplace environments to optimize social distancing and protect customers and employees. Uh, in addition, businesses need to establish plans to regulate customer capacity per Governor Holcomb's back on track plan. 
that is currently 50% capacity. That will increase to 75% capacity on May 24th. It's very important that uh, as we reopen our community and our state that we remember that the COVID-19 pandemic is not behind us. Uh, and it is absolutely imperative that we remain steadfast and vigilant in our approach to this pandemic. Uh, so now more than ever, we all must be smart and cautious and act responsibly. We do not want to let our guard down now and endanger ourselves or others. The Health Department, of course, will be monitoring uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in Tippecanoe County and uh, may issue additional uh, recommendations or requirements if necessary. As of today, uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, pandemic uh, has, has infected, infected more than 1.5 million people in the U.S. In the US. Uh, with uh, 91,000 uh, deaths in the U.S. In the US. Here in Indiana, Here in Indiana uh, we have 29,274 uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 1,716 deaths. Uh, here in Tippecanoe County, as of today, we have 331 uh, confirmed cases, and uh, it is with uh, great sadness that we report uh, that we have had a, a third uh, death in our county uh, due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, this was an individual uh, who was over the age of 60 and had several high-risk medical conditions. As I mentioned last week, uh, here in Tippecanoe County, uh, our highest uh, affected age groups by COVID-19 are individuals aged 20 to 29 and aged 30 to 39, accounting for 22.1% uh, and 21.5% of positive uh, cases, respectively. Uh, testing capability continues to increase here in Tippecanoe County. Uh, well over 5,000 uh, individuals have been tested in our county. Uh, in addition to the uh, hospital uh, testing sites and our commercial lab testing sites, uh, the Indiana State Department of Health uh, free testing site uh, remains open. It has moved uh, from the National Guard Armory to the Evangelical Covenant Church located at 3600 South 9th Street in Lafayette. It is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, testing is free, but uh, it is by appointment only. Uh, so individuals who are interested in testing should uh, register uh, either on their website uh, or by telephone. Uh, that site is providing testing for individuals who have symptoms consistent with COVID-19 and also individuals who are asymptomatic if they are at high risk because of age, being over 65, have diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, or another underlying condition. If they are a member of a minority population, that's at greater risk. If they are pregnant, or if they are a close contact of confirmed uh, COVID-19 positive patients. The Tippecanoe County Health Department uh, continues to closely monitor uh, several data points uh, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic in our county. Uh, the first, of course, is the number of uh, new confirmed or suspected COVID-19 cases in Tippecanoe County. The second is the percentage of uh, COVID-19 tests that are positive. Uh, that percentage is currently 6.5%. Uh, for the state of Indiana, uh, that percentage is 15%. Nationally, the percentage is 10.2. So we remain uh, uh, under uh, both the state and national uh, percentages. Uh, we also, of course, monitor closely the number of hospital admissions and intensive care unit admissions for COVID-19, and uh, also the number of ER visits for respiratory illnesses. Uh, ER visits in uh, Tippecanoe County for respiratory illnesses uh, did decrease from April 5th through May 10th. Uh, but uh, just uh, in the past week have increased uh, 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 some, uh, though not as high as they were uh, in early April. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, we are also monitoring uh, the number of deaths in our county due to COVID-19. And as I mentioned, uh, we have one additional uh, death to report today. There are several uh, 
uh, modeling, uh, uh, statistical models uh, that are available uh, uh, to, to predict the course of COVID-19, uh, both nationally and in the state of Indiana. Uh, these models uh, do show or do predict an increase in deaths in Indiana uh, due to COVID-19 through early June. Uh, with a range uh, between uh, 2,000 and 3,500 uh, predicted. So again, this is a, another reason why uh, all of our uh, protective measures, social distancing, masks, hand hygiene, uh, are all uh, very important and remain uh, very important as we uh, continue our journey through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The um, CDC last week uh, announced uh, the uh, discovery of a um, very concerning um, consequence of COVID-19 uh, among children, uh, a condition called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Uh, this is a, a very serious health condition uh, that has been linked to COVID-19. Uh, it involves uh, um, uh, problems in multiple body systems and multiple body organs uh, resulting in children becoming um, critically ill uh, from COVID-19. Uh, there have been uh, over 100 reported cases of this in the state of New York, also cases elsewhere in the U.S. such as Oregon, Illinois. Uh, here in Indiana, we've had one uh, confirmed uh, case of the multi-inflammatory syndrome in a child. Uh, that child uh, was uh, hospitalized uh, at the Riley Hospital, as, uh, as Dr. Box uh, has described in her uh, uh, briefings with the governor. The uh, last uh, topic that I wanted to touch on uh, briefly uh, is a topic that we've received a lot of questions about at the health department, and that is uh, recreational sports leagues. Uh, the governor's Back on Track Indiana plan uh, specifies that Recreational sports uh, leagues may resume on June 14th. Uh, until we learn otherwise uh, from uh, Governor Holcomb, uh, we interpret uh, that date to also be the date that practices can begin. Uh, we have heard that Governor Holcomb will be providing uh, further information and further details about uh, recreational sports and their practices, and so we are awaiting uh, that uh, information from the governor. Uh, the health department will be um, uh, putting together uh, some guidelines for recreational sports leagues, and we hope to uh, issue those guidelines uh, in the near future. Uh, that concludes all of my uh, remarks for today. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn things over to our other panel members if they have anything they'd like to add. So Jim Bean, again, from IU Health Arnett. I'm the chief medical officer there. Um, just a, a couple updates. Our hospital's stable. Our um, patient volume has decreased a bit from where we were last week, so we're back down into what we categorize as phase two of our surge plan. So that's a good thing. Um, we're stable in equipment and stable in our um, availability of personal protective equipment. And we have been, over the last um, week, cautiously expanding our elective cases and um, setting a plan for gradually expanding more face-to-face -face visits within our clinic practices. Um, I was really pleased to hear uh, your strong admonition for masks and uh, you know what concerns me for us over the next weeks is uh, three things are falling into place at the same time. We're going to uh, phase three of the governor's plan, just as the wet, four things, just as the weather's starting to get better and Memorial Day is coming and graduation uh, celebrations are here. And I just want to really emphasize the essential need for us to, to stick with the plan that Dr. Adler just uh, described. If you're, if you're going to host a a gathering over Memorial Day or a graduation celebration, please have hand sanitizer available for your family members and your guests. Please, if you have access, get masks for people who may show up without them. This is going to be a very high-risk time for our region as we 
get back to trying to engage and open up um, that could uh, a week or more from now put more and more pressure on the most vulnerable in our community and on the health care facilities trying to meet their needs. I'll pause there. Thank you, Dr. Bean. Yep. So to give you an update on what's happening at Franciscan, we, as of this morning, had um, have 19 uh, positive patients in the hospital and another 13 individuals who we are under investigation and ruling out as suspect patients. Happy to report that um, we have no one uh, who's on a ventilator who is COVID positive at this point. We've had a number of individuals who have been on ventilators for uh, a number of days now who have been able to come off the ventilator. So we're very um, encouraged by that. Um, we do have four individuals who were investigating who are on the ventilator, but um, just to kind of give an update of where we're at uh, currently. I think one of the uh, messages we'd like to make is that um, I think as hospitals, we are going to have to learn how to uh, do two things at the same time. We're going to have to learn how to take care of individuals who are COVID positive or suspect or rule out. Uh, it's, they're not going to go away. They're going to be with us, and we'll have people in the hospital probably for the foreseeable future that are either positive or suspect that we're investigating. We have to learn how to do that well and also how to take care of individuals who are not suspect or do not have COVID, uh, who are not COVID positive. And under that, we, we're working very hard to make that environment safe for safe and effective for both uh, groups of individuals. Um, and again, I'd just like to reiterate the, the importance of appropriate medical evaluation for individuals who need medical evaluation. We continue to hear stories on a daily basis through our emergency room, particularly of individuals who needed care and delayed care and suffered consequences because of their delay in care. So the concern is um, if you need appropriate, if you need care, if you are symptomatic, if you have a chronic condition and need follow-up, please see your doctor. Please come to the emergency room if that is a necessary component of what you need to do or go to the urgent care. So please do not delay care because of the concern of, well, I don't want to go to the hospital because that's where the COVID virus is. Um, and so we really want to encourage people to just, if you need care, please come and get appropriate care. Um, one of the other things that you will see is as we are, uh, both hospitals are opening up and we're now into a little more than two weeks into our opening up and some of our elective cases, um, we are requiring um, any individual who does have and is scheduled for an elective procedure, elective invasive procedure or surgery, that prior to the procedure, um, they will have a test to determine that they are negative prior to their procedure for COVID-19. So we will see numbers go up as far as testing, and we're really um, happy about the capability of our testing that um, has continues to increase. Um, and we are um, pushing on that because as we open up and do more elective cases, we are having those individuals have testing prior to their procedure. We continue to follow closely um, as our hospital as a system regarding our personal protective equipment, and we are um, um, watching that carefully, but at a good place at this particular point. Um, so we continue to watch all of those uh, variables as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wickert. Commissioner Brown? Well, on, uh, on behalf of the uh, Board of Commissioners and the mayors of our two cities, uh, but thank you again for uh, not only being with us today, but working this through this process with us. I guarantee you that there's not a person in this room that doesn't want more normal than we have right now. And I, it's coming. We just, we have no way of predicting when it's going to come. But we absolutely know that if we don't stick together and we, ha and we have people not doing just the little things that they should be doing, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow the recovery. It'll slow the recovery in, in terms of health care. It'll slow the recovery in terms of our, our local business uh, operations as well. Uh, to share with you basically what is happening in county government and city government alike, um, we are all planning to um, open our doors as much as we can starting the 26th, the day after Memorial Day. Um, 
and business will continue to be different than it has been in the past. We still strongly encourage citizens, if you can reach out to us for the services that you need, uh, if it's paperwork type services, we have obviously proven that that can be done uh, remotely through email and phone calls and things like that. And, and that is probably the new norm for us moving forward. Um, if you have to come into our buildings, again, we want you to pay attention to signage posted at our front doors that are going to provide some things for you to think about in terms of your current health status uh, and, and, you know, if you had a fever, those types of things. And we are making hand sanitizer available at, at nearly every office in county and city government and, again, want citizens to take advantage of that being provided for you. The one exception to that 26th opening will be our, any, anything that is part of our judicial or criminal justice system, meaning primarily the courthouse and the 111 building downtown. Uh, those will remain in the status that they're in right now, which is by appointment order only, until the first day of June. So we have two different dates that we're looking at in county government. And I want to echo the sentiment of Dr. Adler and Dr. Bean, Dr. Dr. Wickard. There, I mean, you have to take you have to take a layered approach. I know there are folks out there, I've talked to them, who don't, you know, they've read, uh, read masks are good, masks don't work. The, the bottom line is, it, folks, it's easy. If you can, it, the toughest thing is, is sometimes finding them, and that is getting better. It's even getting better for us. But it, if you take a layered approach and, it, and be sure that you are maintaining distance, stay away from people who are ill, obviously, um, and wear a mask and wash your hands and don't touch your face. If you do all of those things, uh, it significantly reduces the opportunity for you to be a victim of the, of the virus. And again, uh, this is more about protecting the people around you than it is protecting you. So it, I'd be the first to admit that they are uncomfortable, and I try to, uh, you know, I put it, put it on if I'm going to be out in public, um, when I'm sitting at my desk and there's no one else around, I don't have it on. But if you can just be smart, take the layered approach and do all of these things. At a, we recognize this time of year, it's going to be a little more difficult because this is the out and about time of year. And it's the time of year where people are collecting at events and things like that, where there, uh, where there are a lot of people. But we really, we need to buckle down. And this is a time that we really need your help. I, I want to close by saying before we start taking questions, um, Dr. Adler and his staff, uh, Dr. Adler, Dr. Wicker, Dr. Bean, all of their staffs, Amanda, Kayla, and the health department, these folks have been on nonstop for weeks. And um, they don't get a lot of thanks for that. But we, we appreciate your work. Uh, it means a lot. And there'll, there'll come a time for us to, to celebrate that together. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not right now. But uh, oh, goodness. And also, two people at the back of the room, if I'm handing out thank yous, Max Walling, Paula Bennett. We have had them uh, working so far out of their job descriptions in the last few weeks to bring this broadcast uh, to everybody on a weekly basis, not only this, but our, uh, our public meetings that are streamed and everything. So uh, they deserve absolutely all the credit uh, for making this happen. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Okay. Adler. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. I, I did want to make one additional comment. Um, Commissioner Brown had mentioned that Masks are not always easy to find, and I wanted to uh, mention that the CDC website uh, actually has a great, uh, easy-to-follow uh, set of instructions for making your own masks at home. They have three options on there. Two of the options do not require any sewing at all. Uh, they utilize a T-shirt and a bandana and show you step-by-step uh, -step with easy-to-follow easy -follow diagrams of how to make your own homemade uh, cloth face mask. Uh, so that's on the CDC website, uh, and that's a great uh, resource um, to, uh, to help um, uh, provide uh, and make masks for everybody. Uh, with that, we will um, take questions from the media and also from our Facebook Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Darling from WLFI. Uh, several Indiana cities have already canceled their Fourth of July celebrations and plans. Is there any such plan here for Tippecanoe County? Uh, we are in discussions about that uh, very topic and um, hope to have a um, decision about that sometime next week. Uh, 
Um, Anna Darling again. Um, stage three is set to start on Saturday of the governor's plan. Is there any plan for us to deviate off of that plan? Are we still going with those recommendations from the governor? Um, and yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, we are uh, on track to follow the stage three um, guidelines uh, created by Governor Holcomb. Um, as we've said all along, we're watching all of our local uh, data uh, very closely, the, the multiple data points that I had, I had mentioned. And uh, if we see uh, any uh, concerning trends, uh, then uh, we may need to um, uh, instate um, additional recommendations or requirements uh, uh, based on our local data. But um, uh, we are uh, going to proceed with the stage three as, as outlined by Governor Holcomb. Question from Facebook Live. One of Governor Holcomb's guiding principles for reopening various sectors of the economy is that the number of hospitalizations for COVID-19 has decreased for 14 days. Is that criteria satisfied in Tippecanoe County? And is any data publicly available on hospitalizations for COVID-19, either statewide or in Tippecanoe County? Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, data for hospitalizations statewide uh, is available on the um, Indiana State Department of Health COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, they have uh, some nice infographic um, uh, representations of that. Uh, as for local uh, hospital data, uh, each week at this press briefing, uh, doctors Bean and Wickard are kind enough to share with us uh, their hospital uh, uh, data. Um, and uh, we've been, uh, I think, uh, fortunate in our county to uh, so far have had a, a relatively low uh, incidence of hospitalization for COVID-19. Uh, those numbers tend to remain uh, stable uh, from week to week with small uh, changes up and down as, as one would expect. Uh, what we're of course watching for is a significant increase uh, in those numbers. Um, the uh, uh, the 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 14-day uh, decrease of hospitalizations is is um, uh, not as easy to attain when the numbers of hospital of hospitalizations is is relatively low. Uh, Dr. Spina and Wickard, I don't know if you wanted to add anything uh, to those uh, statements. Uh, well, what I referenced earlier, I didn't give a specific number, but we have six patients in the hospital with COVID-19 as of early this morning. So, as I said, down from uh, our peak of the last couple of weeks, uh, my assessment of um, the volume of patients we've been taking care of is that it's really been relatively stable over the last many weeks. And I agree with Dr. Adler's comment that it's hard to, you know, to see week over week improvement when our numbers are, are relatively small to begin with. Um, but my assessment is it's pretty stable, especially when I know what's going on uh, in our colleagues' facility across town. Jordan Smith, the Purdue Exponent. Um, with in-person voting, early voting starting next week in the election, June 2nd, I'm just wondering if voters who show up without masks will be given masks by poll workers? and what else the health department is coordinating with the Board of Elections to provide. Um, Commissioner Brown, do you have any comments about the Board of Elections? Absolutely. Uh, it is my understanding, and I don't know the specifics of what came in with the shipment, but our, our local Board of Elections did uh, receive a significant amount of PPE, uh, hand sanitizer, and I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that that included masks, but I haven't actually seen those or talked to anybody about them. But enough that we would have that on hand uh, for the elections because obviously you have to touch the election equipment. And, and in talking to, to Julie Roush, I know that even uh, prior to that shipment arriving, she had, uh, she had been able to acquire uh, Clorox wipes and things of that nature. So I, I am very, uh, I'm very confident that, uh, that we'll have ample supplies on hand come election day. We also are seeing that a lot of people are voting uh, by absentee ballot this year as uh, as the process has allowed and I might remind the, everyone that those applications actually need need to be turned in 
uh, to the Board of Elections by 11.59 tomorrow. And then after that, if provided that you get those turned in on time, then you receive an absentee ballot uh, by mail, and then you have up until noon on Election Day to have that in the Board of Elections office. Uh, since we are talking about elections, and we are just uh, a couple of weeks away from that, uh, early voting starts at uh, Tippecanoe County's early vote sites beginning on the 26th. And um, those that information can be found on the Tippecanoe County government, uh, both the website and our Facebook page, if you have any questions about that. Uh, it's, it's better that you do that than call the Board of Elections right now. We would ask that, uh, that if you can get that information online, it's easier for them because they are being obviously inundated with a lot of calls and a lot of applications for absentee ballots. I have a question for the doctors uh, regarding the disease that's being found in the children. Um, is there anything parents should look out for symptom-wise? Is there any kind of message to parents about, not again, not being afraid to bring your children in if they are having these symptoms? Is there anything you'd like to say about that? We're very fortunate that Dr. Bean is a pediatrician. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, Dr. I Adler is a family physician. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we'll start with Dr. Bean. Okay. <laughs> So I'll just emphasize what we heard earlier. It's a very significant illness in a small number of kids. Uh, one of the um, early symptoms is very significant fever. It's not a subtle illness. So I would my recommendation would be if parents are seeing signs of their child getting sick, call, reach out. Um, and the pediatricians and family physicians are available to to engage and to help answer the question whether you need to be seen or not. Um, other symptoms that have been associated with it that would be visible to a parent would be some, some children or many children have rashes, but they feel pretty darn lousy. And so behavior, fever, rash, it's not in stomach and, and intestinal symptoms, vomiting and stomach pain. It's not that the, maybe what we would have thought it starting off with respiratory symptoms, it's, it's, um, that tends to be less likely. Can I go off on a tangent? Of course. The other thing that we're worried about, not related to this specific syndrome, but related to hesitation and lack of access to primary care, is the number of children who are missing or having delayed their immunizations. And nationally, we're starting to see the rates of preventable um, diseases, uh, immunizations for preventable diseases uh, drop down because of this. So um, I want to encourage people to reach out to their primary care providers and uh, make sure that we're doing all we can to help you keep your child up to date on their vaccines. We're available to do that. Great comments. Thank you. Um, what I would add uh, is that, um, you know, for, for, um, a long time with this pandemic, the, the emphasis has been on mm -hmm. uh, protecting um, uh, older individuals, uh, people who have chronic medical conditions, uh, and and preventing those individuals from, from getting COVID-19. And certainly that remains a very important priority. But I think the appearance of this uh, syndrome in, in children does highlight that uh, COVID-19 uh, can infect children and can have very serious, even life-threatening consequences. So we all need to really act responsibly to protect everyone in our community, including children. And uh, uh, children uh, are uh, vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. And unfortunately, in some instances, although a low number, uh, they can develop uh, very serious um, uh, uh, consequences of COVID-19. Question from Dave Banger. Dr. Adler, are there specific parts of the next stage of back on track reopening that have you concerned, including parks and pools? Mm. You know, I think that uh, as, as we've discussed before, um, as, as we reopen and as we progress through these uh, stages of reopening and, and more things become open, uh, more activities are available, more businesses are open, uh, there is, of course, an increased risk of exposure uh, to COVID-19. 
And that's why as we go through uh, this reopening process, uh, the measures that we've been uh, emphasizing uh, here for, for the last several months uh, are even more important uh, now than ever. Uh, social distancing. Uh, when you're out in public, keeping that distance of six feet or more uh, between yourself and other people outside of your household. Wearing masks. Uh, masks work if we all are wearing them. We can protect each other um, by wearing masks in public settings. Uh, frequent hand washing, uh, frequent disinfecting of, of high touch surfaces, uh, all of these measures are going to be even more important as, as we reopen and those are the best tools we have to make the reopening successful. What we don't want to happen is uh, that we have to take a step backwards um, because of uh, you know a large increase in, in uh, case numbers or in hospitalizations and we all have the opportunity to um, be active participants in that and, and we can all uh, act safely and cautiously and, and be smart about this and act responsibly. Uh, we can make the reopening uh, process uh, as safe as possible. Uh, but yes, there are, of course there's concern as, as more things reopen and, and we get involved with more of our normal activities that there could be, uh, of course, more exposure to COVID-19. Question from Facebook Live. Will people having elective procedures also be tested when they leave the hospital to make sure they have not become infected and be asymptomatic? I will let Drs. Weckert and Bean uh, answer that question. At this point in time, we are not performing tests when people leave the hospital. So those tests typically are being performed anywhere from uh, two to four days prior to their procedure. So, and oftentimes the elective procedure will be one with as an outpatient. So they'll go home the same day. So they, uh, we are not doing a test as they leave the hospital. Same. Not doing a test when they leave the hospital before the procedure, yes. But I will also emphasize that we are uh, implementing and continue to implement really effective uh, infection prevention practices within our hospitals and within our facilities to make the likelihood of sharing this germ and other germs in a hospital as low as possible. Thank you. Question from Dave Banger. How has the first week or so of restaurants and retail reopening going? Are there any violations the health department has to chase or how many have been? Mm. Uh, so far, uh, I think it's gone well. Um, I have not been informed by our uh, foods staff of uh, really any issues with um, restaurants. Uh, there was, of course, the, um, the issue with uh, a long line of customers at a at a bar uh, near Purdue last week, uh, but that issue, uh, as we discussed last week, has has been addressed. Uh, and as far as I know, um, uh, uh, everything's been going uh, going smoothly. Uh, retail establishments, um, the health department does not routinely inspect retail establishments uh, unless they uh, provide um, uh, food or or tattoos. Uh, we often will get, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we'll get complaints about establishments. We haven't really received uh, any about uh, particular issues at retail establishments. So I think um, to us that's a good sign that um, people are, are trying to do the right thing and, and go about this in a safe manner. Question from Facebook Live. What percentage of out-of-county COVID cases are in the two local hospitals? I don't know the location of origin of our patients. And I can't, I can't tell you a specific percentage. We do take care of individuals from surrounding communities as both hospitals do. Um, uh, but I don't have a percentage of those who would be in the house, in our hospital, who would be from outside counties, outside of Tippecanoe. <clears throat> Another question from Facebook Live. Would you consider having one family member have access to suit up and be with 
the ill or dying loved ones? That's a great question. I think for nationally, for healthcare organizations, limiting visitors, especially in, um, especially in end of life situations has been one of the most difficult decisions that we've had to make. I can say that at IU Health or not, we have a process and throughout the IU Health system, we have a process that does allow for visitation of patients with COVID-19 who are dying with, for visitation of um, loved ones to come. It's, a, it's limited and it's a, a time limited uh, chaperoned visit. Um, we, we help people don and doff their uh, PPE and accompany them to the bedside uh, during that time, but we're trying to accommodate at least to some degree um, in particular at that time. In a similar fashion, we have policies in place that would allow individuals at end of life, both either positive for COVID or non-COVID, to allow, again, a limited number uh, for a limited time period, assisting them in, in putting on and taking off all of the PPE, but a similar process that we have at Franciscan also. Question from Dave Banger. Does Tippecanoe County plan to give details about nursing home cases or how many there have been? Um, the, the fortunate thing for our county uh, thus far is that we have not had any uh, confirmed positive COVID-19 cases in uh, nursing homes in our county. Uh, and I think that's in large part due to the excellent job that all of our facilities have been doing uh, in terms of uh, visitor restrictions and screening their staff and monitoring their uh, their residents very closely uh, so we hope that that trend will continue uh, that's obviously a, a vulnerable population and um, uh, we we are hopeful that uh, that trend will continue Question from Emily Seiberg from WBAA. Since gatherings of up to 100 people can start on Sunday, and given Dr. Bean's point about Memorial Day and graduation gatherings and warmer weather, is it realistic to think that a group of up to 100 people can safely social distance? I mean, I think that depends on the, um, the, the, the group itself and the setting that they are gathering in. Uh, as groups get larger, of course, social distancing becomes more difficult, uh, but uh, it is something that we all need to take very seriously. And uh, if people are organizing uh, social gatherings of that size, uh, they really need to put a lot of thought into um, the setting of the uh, gathering and what arrangements can be made so that social distancing can be optimized and the availability of masks and hand sanitizer for your yes. guests. Great point, thank you. Jordan Smith, Purdue Exponent. Um, Dr. Adler, you mentioned the IU public health study. Yes. I believe it found, you said, 2.8% prevalence mm -hmm. among the 4,600 random tests, which would be 186,000 Hoosiers. Do you think a study like that is enough to call into question the somewhat fast reopening plan that the state is currently on? Uh, that, that's a great question. And um, that, uh, um, uh, when, when that data was shared by the IU um, School of Public Health, it was actually shared at Governor Holcomb's uh, press briefing last Wednesday afternoon. They had the two investigators from IU uh, there uh, who were able, able to share that information. And um, the, uh, uh, I think at that time, those investigators, uh, to my knowledge, did not make a recommendation uh, to the governor, and the governor did not indicate that he was going to change his, uh, his plan based on that. But it certainly does um, um, uh, make us all more aware of just how much COVID-19 is here in Indiana and really emphasizes the fact that we need to be very uh, cautious and smart as we uh, progress through the reopening. 
Question from Facebook Live. Can anyone be tested now with the asymptomatic population? We're just wondering how to get tested. Uh, so the um, uh, free State Department of Health testing site uh, that is uh, currently located at the uh, Evangelical Covenant Church at 3600 South 9th Street in Lafayette uh, is testing uh, asymptomatic individuals uh, who meet certain criteria. And those criteria are uh, if an individual is at risk because of age being over 65, if they have diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, or, or another underlying condition, if they're a member of a minority population that's at greater risk, if they're pregnant, or if they're a close contact of a confirmed uh, COVID-19 uh, patient. So uh, if, if you are uh, uh, in one of those categories and, and asymptomatic, you can be tested uh, for COVID-19 uh, free of charge at that uh, testing site. Um, you, do need, you do need to uh, make an appointment uh, uh, before uh, showing up there, uh, either online or by telephone. Some businesses are not letting patrons in without masks. Um, some larger ones that are essential, like grocery stores, are kind of just counting on people to wear them, but they have to let, seem to have to let all in. Should businesses prevent people from coming in without masks or provide them to those who don't mm -hmm. have masks on? No, I, I uh, obviously, we think that everybody should be wearing masks. Uh, we've been saying that all along here, and that includes, of course, customers uh, at uh, at stores and other and other businesses. Um, it, it's whether it's required uh, by a business uh, for their customers to have a mask on to enter their business is really a decision for the business to make. Um, uh, certain businesses. Uh, Customers, or excuse me, uh, employees at certain businesses are actually required to wear masks uh, under Governor Holcomb's plan, and those are um, restaurant uh, employees, uh, grocery store employees, uh, employees at uh, personal service businesses such as hair salons and uh, nail salons, um, employees at uh, professional offices such as medical offices, uh, and um, also uh, employees at uh, manufacturing and industrial facilities uh, per um, their industry best practice guidelines. Uh, so there are requirements uh, there for employees, but uh, it is um, up to the business if they want to require that for their customers. Of course, we recommend that everybody be wearing masks in public settings, and uh, that's just a a smart, uh, cautious way to protect everybody and reduce the transmission of, of COVID-19. Question from Facebook Live. There have been some reports on the Greater Lafayette COVID-19 Mutual Aid Response page of people showing symptoms and having difficulty breathing, but state the paramedics were unable to take them to the hospital because they did not have child care for their children. What would you suggest those families do? Is there an organization that could help those families? That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think a, a good first step would be um, calling the health department um, because uh, we often uh, can, can help in those situations. We have connections with various community organizations that might be able to step in and, and provide some assistance. Question from Emily Seiberg from WBAA. Under the guidelines of stage three, places such as playgrounds, tennis courts, and basketball courts can reopen with social distancing in place. Since these are spaces that involve more physical activity, how does that change social distancing guidelines, and how is social distancing possible on a basketball court during a game? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in those settings, social distancing is difficult uh, to maintain, and that's where wearing a mask comes into play, uh, because uh, the masks are there to help us, especially in 
um, settings where social distancing is, is not always possible. Uh, so uh, I would recommend uh, that um, uh, people wear masks when they are uh, on the playgrounds, uh, on the basketball courts, tennis courts. Uh, that's the smartest thing to do, uh, just like it would be in any other um, public setting where social distancing is, is difficult. Question from Facebook Live. It has been said that the governor is to give an update today on rec leagues and practices in particular. Is Tippecanoe County and the Parks Department prepared to open baseball fields to allow practices if the governor says May 24th these programs can start practicing? Well, as far as the um, uh, baseball fields that are located in, in city or county parks are concerned, that, that would be up to the um, uh, leadership at the city and county level. Um, the uh, um, uh, also, uh, it's worth noting that at this time, uh, all school-based grounds and facilities are uh, closed and will remain closed until June 30th under Governor Holcomb's order. So uh, there would not be able to be any sort of practices or games that take place on uh, school grounds or school facilities. Uh, the um, uh, Governor uh, is expected to um, to make some sort of an update on recreational sports leagues and, and practices and when those can begin. We have not heard what that update is going to be. Uh, at this time, uh, we are operating under the interpretation of uh, his back on track Indiana plan as meaning that recreational sports leagues can't start until June 14th and that would include practices also. Another question from Facebook Live. With 331 cases in Tippecanoe County, as today with a rate of 25% increase in number of cases in the last few weeks, can we assume we are being hit by a delayed peak of COVID cases in the county? Uh, it's always a possibility, um, and we watch those numbers from day to day very closely. And one thing you'll notice if you look at the day to day new case uh, data, uh, it goes up and down. Um, we'll have uh, days where uh, we have um, a larger uh, increase in new cases, such as uh, today uh, it was 18. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was 6 or 8, so it was lower. Um, and so it goes up and down. And what we look at is, uh, you know, the overall trend and uh, whether we're seeing uh, a consistent or, or persistent increase in, in those daily new cases. Uh, so we're watching it very closely and uh, taking uh, that into consideration you know, as we make our, our decisions in, and uh, come up with our plans. Our last Facebook Live question, how will you help protect workers from angry patrons who refuse to follow safety protocol and wear PPE? Hmm. Well, I, I think um, uh, I, I would encourage, uh, of course, any any worker or member of the public who feels uh, threatened in any way uh, to notify the police, uh, just as, as you would uh, for any other situation. Uh, and um, uh, that would be, I think, the, the most prudent way to, to address that. Uh, Commissioner Brown, do you have any comments about that as former sheriff? Well, I can tell you it is very difficult to legislate common sense, okay? Um, I, I know I've, I've got friends out there that, that think that the whole mask thing is absolutely bogus, and I'm, and I'm just going to tell you, you're wasting your time and energy to go against what has become the norm. Uh, I understand they're not easy to come by, but there are more and more outlets out there where you can, where you can purchase them, keep them in your car, keep them in your office. Virtually everywhere I go, I see people wearing masks. It wasn't that way three weeks ago. So it is not worth uh, it, it is not worth getting into a fist fight over whether or not you're going to put your mask on. It is also not worth having to having to tax an already taxed criminal justice public safety system uh, over making an argument over something that there simply should not be an argument over. So use good common sense. You know, if I if I didn't want to wear a mask and I knew I was going into a place that was going to require it, I'd simply find another place to do business if I felt 
that strongly about it. You always have the choice. Just use good common sense in your choices. Thank you. Great comments. I think that uh, concludes our questions for today. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and uh, we will see you next Wednesday. Thank you. And the bottom line still remains there's no place to